turn to uh, Psalm 14, if you don't mind. And I'm going to be beginning uh, a new series uh, called How Do I Know? And uh, let me tell you a little something, though, that happened to me this last week because you, you might be a guest. And if you're a guest, um, I'm glad you're, I'm extremely glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Um, but this might be the first time you've ever seen me. And so uh, I just want to kind of take a moment, like if we met somewhere and say hi to you and, uh, you know, uh, hope my jacket is okay, you know. Debbie picked it out. It's a little wild, I know. Um, <clears throat> but um, the reason is because this last week something happened to me and it rattled me a little bit. Uh, you know, I go places and because the church is so large and because of television, uh, people, you know, recognize me. And so I'm kind of used to that look or, or comments, you know. Uh, a while back, this lady came up to me and whispered. She said, do you know who you are? <laughs> I, I, just, I thought about joking with her and saying, no, I've been waiting all my life for someone to tell me. So, but I, I didn't. And then uh, one time I was checking out and this lady was doing this and she looked up and she said, oh, she said, you're, 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 uh, uh, you're, uh, and I said, Robert Moore. She said, no, uh. <laughs> So, this last week I had a reaction, and it was, it was she didn't know me at all or had, had seen me or recognized me, but it was different because I'm kind of used to the other, you know. Uh, but I went to check in for a medical procedure at a place I'd never been, and uh, this woman looked up and she said, oh my, like that. And I thought, well, you know, she recognizes me, she comes to church or something, you know. Um, and so before I tell you what she said, let me give you context. Uh, how, do you remember the, the Barbie doll? Remember the doll named Barbie? Okay. So I, I said to her, she said, oh my, like that when she looked at me. And I said, um, is there a problem? And she said, you look just like a Ken doll. Thank, thank you. You know, I didn't know what to say. Okay, so, so if this is your first time to see me, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, so let's go on. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking for three weeks on how do I know. And these are the, the subjects I'll cover. Obviously, the first one is for today. But how do I know there is a God? So that's the title of the message today, there is a God. How do I know? Next week will be how do I know the Bible is true? And the next week will be, how do I know Jesus is the only way? Now, I want to emphasize in this, how do I know, uh, I, I'm telling you, uh, I want to emphasize the word I. H how do I know? In other words, I'm not trying to shove anything down your throat. I'm not trying to push religion on you. I'm just simply telling you how I know. And I, I want it to be, again, if you're a guest, I want it to be like maybe we, uh, I would give you an example. Let's say that we work at the same office building and they provide like a food court and one day at the food court I come in and there's a table, a, a chair by you and I say, I sit here, yes, and what department do you work in? This, what department do you work in? And just small talk and then I say, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful actually to be back at work. I was, I was not at work for a while. And you say, well, why were you not at work? And I say, well, I had a, a disease. Uh, the, the disease was, I was told, was incurable. I got worse and worse. Finally, I couldn't talk, couldn't walk, couldn't speak to my family and friends. I was bedridden. And uh, my family heard about a, a, a new drug that the FDA is testing. My family and friends, some of the people here, coworkers at the company, they raised money because it wasn't covered by insurance. I went and I got the new drug and was treated and... Uh, I'm totally cured. And so I'm really glad to be back at work. Now, if I shared that with you, you, you wouldn't think I was trying to shove something down your throat. Uh, it wouldn't be offensive to you at all. It would simply uh, be my story, what happened to me. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so that's the way I want to share how do I know there's a God? Now, you can make your own decision. You, 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 you have a right 
to believe. You have a right to your belief. You have a right to your belief. What I'm asking you is, for the next few minutes, just give me that same right. But I have a right to, to my belief, all right? And I'm going to share it with you, okay? So, how do I know that uh, there, there's a God? Well, uh, I have, um, uh, if you're new here, this might surprise you. If you're not new here, this won't surprise you. I have three points. <clears throat> so here's number one. There is a correct worldview. There is a correct worldview. Uh, it is Christianity. There is no worldview that meets the criteria of being a worldview except Christianity. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, every uh, world, the, a worldview must answer four questions. I'll tell you what the questions are, but let me tell you the words so you can remember them, all right? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. A, a worldview that's going to fulfill you as a person must uh, address these four things. It must address origin. And, and let me give you the, the questions so that would help you to define what I mean. Origin would be, how did I get here? I mean, if you're going to have a worldview that you can live with and that fulfills you, you'd like to know how you got here. How, how'd you get here? Uh, meaning, uh, why am I here? Every human has this in himself or herself. Why, why am I here? Morality, uh, how do I define good and evil? Because every person defines good and evil, so how do you define good and evil? And destiny, what happens to me after death? You understand what I'm saying? And I don't have the time, I wish I did, but I don't have the time to show you how Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, um, uh, Islam do not answer. They, they will leave out one of these. They cannot answer this. And it, it's... Um, it's uh, it's something that's important. It's, it's extremely important for you to determine what your worldview is. I, I would suggest that you go to um, and listen to someone named Dr. Ravi Zacharias. He's been here at our church. He'll be here again in January, by the way, for the first conference. So you want to get here early that evening, I promise you. It'll be full. Uh, I'm actually going to speak for him at his conference in a few months. And we have a good relationship. But you can just go to YouTube and see him speaking at universities like Yale, Harvard, Princeton, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and, uh, and, and letting the students ask him questions. And he is not demeaning at all, but he is, he's brilliant, and he answers it in an intelligent way, the questions. And they're good questions, and we all have good questions. We do have questions, and questions aren't wrong. You ought to have some questions about your worldview. Um, one of the times he, one of the things that he did um, was one of the students said, why are you so afraid of subjective morality? That's a buzzword today. Subjective morality. In other words, each person decides what's right for him. And it's almost come to the place where many Christians will even say, well, people should be able to decide what's right for them. And that, that just shows how, how um, you've not thought this through. This, uh, so this uh, student said to Dr. Zacharias, what, what are you so afraid of? Why are you so afraid of subjective morality? And I listened to the first part of his answer. He said to this student, do you lock your doors at night? Now, let me just tell you what he was saying. You're the one that's afraid of subjective morality. Because if, if morality is subjective, then someone might decide that it's moral to put a bullet through your eyes. So you can't have subjective morality. Murder's wrong. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you say. Murder's wrong. You, you have to have objective morality. It has to be objective. There are some things that are right and there are some things wrong. Hitler did not believe murder was wrong. And I've been to Auschwitz. I've been there twice. I've seen the, the heaps of children's eyeglasses. And I've seen the gas chambers. D don't even think about telling me that each person should decide what's right and wrong because that's wrong. There, there is an absolute. And you really need to, as a person, you need to address what your worldview is and by these four. And I'll just give you just one, another worldview that is very popular today is evolution. 
evolution actually addresses none of these. <laughs> it meets no criteria to be a worldview. It does not address how we got here. It does not address why we're here. It in, in essence says we're time, matter, and chance. Time, matter, and chance. Look, please hear me. If you're just time, matter, and chance, why do you react to tragedy? Are y'all there? I'm, I guess I'm laying some pretty heavy stuff on you. If you're just matter, if you're just a bunch of matter, if you're just metaphysical, and you don't have a soul, why do you react to tra tragedy? You react because you have a soul, because you're a person. And when you see that people were killed and shot and killed, you react because you have a heart and you have a soul. Evolution does not address that at all. It does address why we're here, our origin. It does address meaning of life. Why am I here? How did I get here? It doesn't address morality, and it does not address destiny. That, you know, you just die and nothing happens. And, I, and, and I'll, I'll just give you the biggest one, origin. Uh, evolution began because a man named Charles Darwin wrote a book in 1859. 1859 called The Origin of Species, and he devoted, most people never even read the book, yet they might believe it. He devoted two whole chapters to disproving his theory, to doubting his theory, I should say, doubting. And he said, if, if evidence doesn't come forth in the scientific world uh, in a reasonable amount of time, this theory is disproved. Okay, it's been 156 years. And there is no evidence, study it for yourself, don't listen to someone else, there is no evidence that one species has ever mutated to another species, ever. It's never happened. And here's the thing that really gets me, <laughs> well, it's amazing to me, well, yeah, but this species mutated this species, okay, but where'd that species come from? It doesn't address where the first life cell came from. So, I'm simply telling you it's very important what your worldview is, and there is a correct worldview that will satisfy your heart and your soul, and it's Christianity. Here, here's the second point. Now, please, before you, please, let me give you a disclaimer, okay? I'm going to talk about atheism and agnosticism, and an atheist is a person who says there is no God, okay? So... Just, just hold on a minute, all right, okay? An atheist is a person that says there is no God. Okay, here's, here's point two. There is no atheist. <clears throat> it is scientifically impossible to be an atheist. Scientifically impossible. And I can prove it, and every one of you here will walk out of here. Even if you disagree with me, you'll walk out of here and say, I have no answer for what he just said. I promise you. Uh, as a matter of fact, the definition of atheism from the word is a person who states there is no God. They have changed that definition to a person who doesn't believe in this in the existence of God. They've changed that because they understand that it is impossible to be an atheist. It's impossible. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it's impossible, it's foolish. I mean, it really is foolishness. So let me, let me explain to you. Um, in order to say there is something doesn't exist, you, you would have to have all knowledge. You'd, you'd have to know everything. For instance, if you said to me, there is no city in Texas called Paris. Uh, I would say to you, have you been to every city in Texas? Have you done a study? Do you have any facts that you based your conclusion on? Because I've been to Paris, Texas. Now, it's nothing like Paris, France. <laughs> and by the way, we beat them in football. But, because <clears throat> I grew up in East Texas. It's in East Texas, and it's a, a little place, but it's there. And I can tell you it's there because I have firsthand knowledge of it. You can't tell me that it's not there unless you do a study and you would have to know every city in Texas to be able to say there's not one called Paris. 
So listen to me carefully. You, you would have to have all knowledge to say there is no God. And no person has all knowledge. Uh, think about it this way. How much does the smartest person in the world know? Now, you, you, can, you can Google this some and you can think. And most very intelligent people, and we have very intelligent people in the world, they say it's probably the smartest person in the world has less than 1% of all knowledge. All knowledge. Let's think about this for a moment. All knowledge, all mathematics, all mathematics, including algebra, um, calculus, uh, however you want to do, whatever you, geometry, whatever, all mathematics, all right, um, all history, all history of every culture that has ever existed, all history of every state in the United States, all history of every country. How much does the smartest person know? You understand what I'm saying? How much does the smartest person know of all language? Every language in the world, can he speak every language, he or she speak every language fluently and dissect every sentence in every language and know every consonant and every vowel and be able to conjugate every verb in every language? Now, I've already lost some of you because you don't even know what the word conjugate means. You, you, <laughs> You think, you know, my wife and I waited until after we were married to conjugate. You know, I don't. <laughs> that just came out, and I like that. <laughs> Conjugation, okay. So, man, it's fun to just sometimes speak off the top of your head and see what comes out. So how much knowledge does every person in the world have? I mean, does, does how much knowledge of the whole world does the smartest person have? Okay, no, it, let's just give them 2%. Is it possible, is it possible, not, not even probable, which it, it, it would be mathematically, it would be probable. But is it possible, by the way, when I said probable, the smartest person in the world right now uh, is a person named uh, Christopher Langan. He has the highest IQ in the world right now. And I'm going to just re read one statement from him. He said, you can prove the existence of God, the soul, and the afterlife using mathematics. And that is the, the person who has the highest IQ in the world right now at this time. So, but let's just say that the smartest person in the world has 2% of all knowledge, and let's say you're, you are that person. Is it possible in the 98% of all knowledge that you don't have, is it possible something exists that you don't know about? Yeah. Of course it is. You, you could not, you, you have to answer in the affirmative of that. It's possible in the 98% of knowledge that you don't have that something exists that you don't know. It's possible. So, I think this is why the Bible says it's foolish. Let me read it to you. If you I told you to turn to it, Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That is the exact statement of the literal definition of atheist. There is no God. And this word fool means foolish person. A foolish person. And when you think about it, it would be foolish to say something doesn't exist when you don't know everything. Now, you can say, I don't know if there's a God. That would be an agnostic. Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnostikos, which means knowledge. Gnosko is the verb, means to know. And when you put A-G in front of it, it means not. In other words, agnostic is a person that does not know. Not know, that's what it means. In other words, an agnostic person says, I don't know if there's a God. When we were in, um, uh, on vacation, we, we sat in this cabana, which was next to the cabana, and this couple, young couple, sat there beside us. And... Um, uh, that we talked and we were having a good conversation. They were expecting their first child. 
we were telling them some things about the hotel because we'd been there before. And the menu came. They were asking us what's good on the menu, and we were telling them. And, and uh, the lady said, um, um, and they were, by the way, their grandparents immigrated from India. And uh, so they were Indian by culture. And so they said to us, uh, we started talking. She said, do you think that um, I could order this without meat, that they could do it without meat? And I said, I think they could. And so I said, Would you, do you mind me asking are you a vegetarian? She said, I'm a vegetarian. I said, do you mind me asking, are you a vegetarian for dietary reasons reasons or religious reasons? And she said, religious reasons. I said, you're Hindu. She said, yes. And then she said, but he's atheist. Just like that, talking about her husband, but he's an atheist. And she knew I was a pastor. I I don't know. She's just trying to, pregnant, you know, trying to start a little something. I don't know. So... (laughs) And he said, well, I I would say that I was an atheist, but I'm not anymore. I'm an agnostic. And I said, well, it's amazing you say that because I'm about to share something with the church. Can I share it with you and see if it would be offensive to you? And he said, no. So I actually shared this. I said, I don't believe you could. it's, It's scientifically possible you could be an atheist. I don't think you can say for sure that there's something that doesn't exist, that you know for sure it doesn't exist when you don't know everything. But I think you can say, I don't know. And he said to me, that's not offensive to me at all. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't say it all exactly the way you said it, but that's why I've changed. Because uh, I don't think I could say positively that there is no God. I don't think I have the ability to say that. So I am now at the place to say, I don't know if there's a God. So here's point three. There, there is a God. There is a God. Now, remember the question is, how do I know there's a God? How do I know? How do I know there is a God? Okay. So you might even turn my reasoning around and say, wait a minute. Uh, since I don't have all knowledge and I can't say definitively that there is no God, you don't have all knowledge either, Pastor. So how can you definitively say there is a God? Well, it's really simple. I'm most it to you. Let's take my example of saying there is no Paris, Texas. Let's change that now to a person. Let's say that you said to me, there is no Tom Lane. You told me that, okay? Tom's seated right down here on the front row. Tom is our (laughs) lead executive senior pastor. And um, so let's say that you came to me and said, there is no Tom Lane. There is not a person that exists named Tom Lane. My question would be to you, have you met everyone in the world? And I would say to you, you can't. Tell me that there is no Tom Lane unless you've met everyone in the world. Would you, would, don't you agree with that? You, you can't tell me that. But I can tell you there is a Tom Lane. Now listen carefully because you're going like this. And you say, well, how can you definitively say that? Because you don't have all knowledge. You've not met everyone in the world. I don't have to meet everyone in the world. I just had to admit Tom Lane. See, I can tell you there is a Tom Lane because I've met him. I talk with him and he is my friend. And I can tell you that there is a God because I have met him. I talk with him and he is my friend. I grew up in church, and I heard about God. I walked an aisle, and I signed a card when I was about eight years old. When I entered my teenage years, I fell into this group that I thought was tough and cool. And pretty soon, I was doing drugs, and I liked drugs. I liked the escape that I had because I had no answer for why am I here. 
I had no answer for how do I define good and evil. I had no answer for what happens to me after I die. I had no worldview. I got deeply involved in drugs and immorality. It's very shameful for me to say immorality because I know the immorality that I was involved in. And I was very involved in immorality. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't change. And when I was 19 years old, I was actually in a motel room. It's called Jake's Motel, room 12. And this guy started sharing with me about Jesus. And you know what I said to him? I know about all that. I know about Jesus. I've accepted Jesus into my heart. And he began to explain to me, you've not accepted Jesus into your heart. Because when you accept Jesus, you accept him as Lord. You give your will to him. See, you need to understand in the Christian worldview, God created you. But God didn't want robots. So he created you with a mind so that you could think, with a heart so that you could feel, and with a will so that you could choose. He's not going to force you to choose him. You have a choice. But all of us have chosen at some time in this life to go the wrong way. So God sent his son Jesus to die an agonizing, horrible, torturous death on a cross to pay for all of our sins. So that if we believe in Jesus, we'll submit our will to Jesus, we can be saved, the Bible says, uses that word. We can be forgiven of all of our sins and we spend eternity with God, because you have a soul. That's why you feel when you hear of a tragedy. Your soul is going to live past your physical body. It's going to live on. The question is, is it going to live in heaven with God or in hell without God? Because there is a heaven and there is a hell. And God wants you to live forever with him in heaven, so he provided the way. The only problem is that he gave you a choice. So you have the ability to choose if you are going to love and serve and follow Jesus Christ on this earth or not. And that determines your destiny. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And we do this, if you're a guest, we do this every week. The reason we do this is every weekend I say, I want you to just take a moment and personalize this message. In other words, what is God saying to you? And you might be feeling this tugging in your heart that maybe you have believed in your mind about God and even Jesus but you've never really submitted your will to him. I'm asking you to do that today. I want to help you. When I was in that motel room, this guy that was sharing with me, he helped me to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to help you right now to give your life to Jesus Christ at every campus, at every affiliate church. I want to help you. If you need to give your life to Jesus, I want to just lead you in a prayer. And I promise you, God will hear this prayer. You pray a prayer that's sincere from your heart. God hears it. And I think you have a tugging on your heart right now, some of you that are listening to me. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer right now and just give your life to Jesus, all right? Just, you don't have to pray. I'm not asking you to pray out loud. Right now, I'm simply asking you to pray from your heart. So in your heart, if that's you, no matter which campus you're attending, even if you're in one of the overflow rooms, would you simply pray this prayer? Would you say, dear God, just tell them that, dear God, I ask you, tell him, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin and to come into my life 
today. And tell him this, say, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. Now, no one's looking around at every campus. If you prayed that prayer and you gave your life to the Lord right now, I'd like to know it. And I believe also it's a testimony even to God. I'm going to ask you to do something. Again, no one's looking around. If you prayed that prayer and you gave your life to the Lord right now, would you just put your hand up right and see it? Put it way up high. You ought to be proud to put it up. You ought to be proud to put it up. Put it way up high. Way up high. God bless you. Many hands. Put it way up high. Way up high. I prayed that prayer right now and I really meant it. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Many of you. There were many of you that said, I prayed that prayer. Now listen, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. In just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to have a worship song. And during that time, I'm going to ask you to come to the front of whichever room where you are. You could be in one of the overflow rooms or one of the other campuses or at the South Lake campus or North Fort Worth campus, North Richland Hills campus, Frisco, Grand Prairie, wherever you are. I just want you, as soon as we stand up, I want you to stand up. I want you to step out and come to the front. There'll be someone here to meet you at every campus. I want some of the altar ministries there, people there, just to simply meet them because I want to pray with them, but just to say to them, congratulations, way to go. I want, if you gave your life to Jesus, I'm asking you to take a public stand, not to say anything publicly, but to take a public stand by coming down to the front of whichever building where you're meeting. And listen, let me tell you why I'm saying this. It's very important. Jesus said, if you'll take a public stand for me, I'll take a public stand before for you before my Father in heaven. So if you prayed that prayer, and there were many of you, I saw your hands, you might even turn to the person beside you and say, would you go with me? I need, I need to go. I need my life changed. So if you prayed that prayer and you gave your life to the Lord, then as soon as we stand up, you just stand up, step out and come to the front. I'll meet you down here, or someone will meet you at another campus, but I want to pray with you one more time. So please, so make up your mind right now, right? Holy Spirit, I pray you'll draw every person at every campus that prayed that prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. As soon as you stand up, come on, just step out and come. Come on, step out and come. And if people are coming, yeah, let's welcome them, all right? Come on, come on, come on. Don't wait to see if someone else is going to come. Come on. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'll pray with you in just a minute. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, you prayed that prayer, come on, come on, don't be embarrassed, all the way from the second level, so, I'm so proud of you, man, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming, come on, come on, there were more of you that said I prayed that prayer, so come on, if you need to come, come on, please don't be embarrassed, come on, come on, if you need to come, you prayed that prayer, come on. Okay, I want to I want to talk to you just for a moment. I know, guys, I'm really proud of you. You know, with this many people, you know, I'm proud of you. You 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 are taking a public stand for Christ. There's no doubt. I want to pray with you again. And those of you who are at another campus, I want to pray for you. And if you haven't come to the front, whether you're at another campus or here, you can still come. While I'm talking, you can come. If you still feel that tug and think I, I should have gone. And again, if you know the person beside you, just turn to the person beside you and say, would you walk down there with me? I, I need some support right now. But come on, if there's someone, I really feel there's someone else that needs to come. So if you need to come while I'm talking, you, could, you just step on out and come, all right? Uh, but guys, I want to pray with you one more time. And I'm going to ask you to do something a little different than last time. And that is I'm going to ask you to pray out loud. And uh, you'll, you'll see as you grow in your life for the Lord why I'm asking you. But I'm going to tell you now why I'm asking you. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, God made you a speaking creature. And so I'm asking you simply to say it loud enough where you can hear it just to, just to say it with your mouth. And I want to pray with you again. And again, if you're at another campus or watching online or on television, I want you to say it also out loud. All right. So would you just repeat after me? All right. Say, dear God, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. And I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, 
for saving me today. Amen. 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 I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I'm so proud of you.